I met you first. Was it Aubrey that introduced us? Uh, yes. Like, so I saw the plunge like on his Instagram and I, I was like, that thing is just stunning. It was like, and of course it was part of my world, but I had a, a horse trough, you know, <laughs> that was like 175 bucks from Amazon or whatever. And I was just wasting so much water and ice. And uh, I saw that and I was like, damn. So I, I reached out to him. I was like, any chance you could introduce me? <laughs> and then here we are. Yeah. Buddies. And I remember, I mean, the thing that I was <clears throat> drawn to you or like, so quickly because you were our first stop on our plunge tour yeah when we were mike and i were delivering some plunges to people i think we did rich roll yeah we did the yes theory crew but you were the first stop and i remember like dropping into your house and you had like this was in santa barbara and you have just a such a childlike like playful energy yeah that i remember being there that day and being like i could spend all day here with you like it was <laughs> like and that's such a testament to you like thank you and it, it you equally all your stuff online you can drop in and be so focused with people yeah and it's a it's so impressive to me Thank like you. who you are in the different spaces meeting life where it's at yeah you clearly are a dude that lives limitless yeah like into your yeah you know thought processes and just how you go about life and it's 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 super cool and inspiring and it's been awesome to get to know you well i, I appreciate that it's uh it's it's a beautiful compliment and it's it's well received and i one of the things that i've pri sort of prided myself on as i looked at myself as a human being and i said if there were three particular qualities that i could embody i always said i want to have the wisdom of an old man or an old woman you know just like a, a, a wise old sage mm -hmm. to have that kind of mind but to have the body of a 20 something year old but to maintain the heart of a child. Dude, you're nailing it. Because <laughs> you also have the thing where it's like, I remember you made a joke the first day we were together about your age. And yeah. I was like, I don't know how old Peter is. Right. Like, and I still don't know how old you are. <laughs> right, and right. it's like, it's to your energy of like, yeah. you have this wisdom of, of yeah. life and you've clearly built this incredible network and organization and who you are to the world impact Yeah, yeah. to... It's kind of childlike, yeah. you know, not take yourself too seriously and able to laugh and have fun. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I love no, that. Well, thank you. No, I mean, it's, I guess it's sort of equally a testament to the power of language and when you declare something, right? So much of what I teach people is to really just be precise with their language because your words are creating a reality. So really for me, making the choice to sort of create that, archetype of myself right so the wisdom uh, of an old person mm -hmm. as it relates to my perspective on life and my mind but to maintain my body as a 20 something year old youthful but as i said to have the joie de vivre of a child and the curiosity and the playfulness so that doesn't happen unless you recognize the importance of sticking to your word which sort of goes back to what we were speaking about off air about communication and honoring what you say you're going to mm -hmm. do for people so that to me is one of the cornerstones of having a powerful life is recognizing that your words create your reality but only if you actually adhere to what you say. So most people are very sloppy with language. They say things they don't mean, they don't do what they say. And for that reason, their life invariably doesn't work. So um, that's a good point. Cause I mean, we are, our word is who we are. Yeah. Like it's really, and then the action that follows. Yes, that's word. where the power comes in, right? Is to say, so I think a lot of people, unfortunately, because the, the predominant paradigm that people live in right now is fear and survival, right? So that's a primal response, right? We feel threatened by whatever the environment might be. It could be a boss, it could be a spouse, it could be a family member, it could be something to do with our financial security or the absence of it. And so for the most part, especially over these last two years, people are in this state of fight or flight. And so from that perspective, most people's energy is very reactive. It's not creative. And that's one of the distinctions I teach people. When you're reactive, you're actually trying to avoid something happening usually. Mm. Whereas creative is you're like committed towards something. So most people live their lives where they're trying to get away from a history that they've yet to reconcile, mm -hmm. which means they're constantly dragging it around with them, right? So the heartbreak, the, the failure, the loss, whatever it is that really hurt, then the brain, because it's designed to predict and protect, is trying to avoid that repetition which ironically means that you're still actually focused on it and therefore the self-fulfilling prophecy right it, so <laughs> it's like the i've always 
I've it took me years to discover this and I still I'm very good at what I don't want mm-hmm. <laughs> as opposed to getting clear on what I want. Mm-hmm. And so you, to your point, it's like I'm always avoid like yeah. when I'm on the don't want. Yeah. I'm just really living out of that as my focus point. Yeah. And that's something that I've had to help a lot of athletes with, particularly like I remember one of my NBA guys who was really struggling from the free throw line. He actually had the worst percentage in the league. And it's only human nature that as he stepped up to the line and he was being purposely fouled by the opposing team because, you know, it was just a strategy, right? Go, go to the worst player. Mm-hmm. But as he's standing at the free throw line, his brain is, of course, what its main focus was, don't miss. <laughs> Right, and what's this he going to do? Right, <laughs> you know. So this is it. Sadly, as I said, it's just the the current dimension that most people function from, which is a survival based mindset. Um, and so it's the avoidant energy versus like starting to well, you know, with with this particular athlete, I said, well, if I told you that for the rest of the season you were going to shoot like league average, which was seventy five percent, his at the time was like thirty seven percent. It was pretty atrocious. I said, how would you feel? And his face lit up like a little kid who probably picked up a basketball for the first time. He's like, oh. dude, that would be amazing. And I said, well, what I just proposed to you is as real as the future you're worried about because they're both made up and we're still sitting in your kitchen. <laughs> right, right. But, but they elicit different responses, right? So this is where I talk about frequency precedes form, meaning the vibration that we come from, going back to what you were kind of saying about me coming from more of this childlike energy, that's a frequency, that's a vibration. But it is nonetheless the precursor to the way that I think, feel, act, and then consequently the results I get. Conversely, when somebody's coming from a frequency of doubt, of self-judgment, of self-loathing, of worthlessness, of powerlessness, of fear, then their thoughts, feelings, and actions are equally going to be a natural extension of that frequency. And the form, aka the result, is going to reflect that. Yep. So once you understand the cascade of creation, it, it's actually really physics. You know, if, I, if I'm in a state, a vibratory state of joy, of love, of possibility, then that is going to be attractive. Like you even said, the first time we met face to face, you just declared right now that you, you wanted to hang out all day or you could have done. Mm-hmm. Right. So that really speaks to the resonance that you were feeling, the playfulness, the joy of my energy, which actually was creating unbeknownst to me a an outcome which was somebody wants to stay close Mm. now this is how relationships do or don't work too right if somebody has a feeling of inadequacy insecurity or scarcity about themselves they energetically aren't attractive whether it's you know for income and finance or if it's for romance and spouses if the way you view yourself is at a resonance that is unattractive because of your own narrative and dialogue then that does get mirrored out in the world. So for me, like people often very, like you, very generously saying, wow, your life is amazing and this and that and the things you do and the impact you have on millions of people. Like, yes, but that's a natural extension of the way that I just view myself. Got it. So Got it's it. like the into out approach. So people that's the are, byproduct. That's, that's just what's going to play out. Absolutely. Yeah. Where did you, in this frequency you talk about, it's like maybe we're born into it. But there's kind of an unlearning at some point as yeah. we develop our narratives and our stories of who we are. Where did you develop this mindset to actually see the world this way? Shit ton of adversity. Got it. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, that's as, as much as I bring humor to it. It's like, obviously, it's difficult. And especially, again, like we've seen so much, um, so many challenges these last two years for so many people. Mm-hmm. And I think trauma, as difficult as it is for anybody to go through, is nonetheless the catalyst for awakening or it can sometimes sort of be somebody's uncoming too right like you know if it really pushes somebody to the edge it could either be quote unquote the end of their life or the end of a relationship or the end of the job so for me there were some pivotal moments like i have found so much of my freedom my inspiration and my joy through romantic relationships like i'm a lover of love i often you know i've said that i just love love i love mm. the energy of it and what it represents and so i think when i fell in love as best as i knew at the time as a as a young 28 29 year old for the first time that was significant there was this sort of natural tendency to become very attached to that person Mm -hmm. and it also became personified in them right so the way that i perceived the love was oh i found i don't think i said the love of my life but it sort of was in that ballpark right Mm -hmm. and so 
it implies that the love is over there with her. And so mm. life set me up for success and a ton of pain at the same time when she left me after a year and a half or two years. And so I, quote unquote, fell apart emotionally. I couldn't sleep. I was just starting to feel, for me, as this sort of vibrant, you know, even before I became the version of who I am today, and I was somewhat oblivious when I was younger, I was still just a very vivacious guy. But for that period, I just became very melancholy and apathetic, and I had no zest for life. And it was really the reflection of um, the unreconciled hurt from my parents dying. So my mom had died when I was seven, my dad died when I was 17. Oh. And so there was a deep story of loss in there, like I'd lost my parents. And it wasn't necessarily how I related to the experience, but you always hear that. Like I, you know, I would have friends in the most beautiful of intentions say, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss and oh, I heard about your loss. And, you know, so you keep hearing that word loss. <laughs> and so that had become part of what was defining me at a subconscious level. And so here I found love, you know, which to me as a human being, there's nothing really much more valuable. We think cash is or status or whatever. But so it had all of this significance about it. But on this very fragile sort of sand like foundation of the fear of loss. Mm -hmm. So finding something that to me at the time was this sort of quintessential expression of the intimacy of a connection with another human being suddenly became so exacerbated by the underlying fear of loss so that I became the perfect boyfriend, <laughs> Got it. which was really a strategy, a compensation, right? An adaptation. So really the underlying energy. I, w I, was, I was a great boyfriend. I wasn't, you know, like I was very loving. And even that was her comment when she left. She said, you know, I have to leave. And I was like, why? You know, and she said, you're too, you're too loving. <laughs> Your love is suffocating. <laughs> and I was like, wait. That doesn't sound like a problem. <laughs> but, but then I really got it. It was because it was subtly inauthentic. I was very loving, very generous, all of the qualities you'd want to have in a partner. But the energy underneath was fear. And I didn't know that. So there was no, you know, I didn't, I didn't berate myself once I saw it. But yeah. that was the catalyst. As she left, I fell apart six, eight weeks, you know. And then I suddenly had this revelation where I was sitting at my desk in a rent control apartment in Santa Monica, you know, but I like barely owned anything. Were and, you into um, coaching at all at this time? No, I was a trainer. Any, you were like a personal trainer. I was a fitness, fitness trainer. trainer. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That Got was it. my previous career, traveling the world with a couple of Hollywood VIPs. That's another good story. But um, yeah, so I'm sitting there and um, this was actually, this whole transformation was truly the catalyst for me to start my business because it was so like unlike anything I'd ever experienced in my life. Like I literally stepped through a portal into a different dimension and completely different iteration of myself and I never saw life the same again. Mm. So when I was sitting at this desk in this rent control apartment, my mind had sort of this incessant series of questions that was going on sometimes at the point where i couldn't sleep because my mind is like where is she and we're going to see her again like what like this sort of deep self-preservation concern you know mm. but in the arena of relationships and love it's almost all, like this hopelessness that takes in there's nothing it's like you can't breathe yeah it's, it's very dramatic yes. you know and you see why there's so many like you know melodramatic situations and romances on tv or songs that get written and i, I get it but as I sat there, for whatever reason, life saw fit to give me this massive epiphany. So I had this series of questions that said, like, where is she? Is she with somebody else? Uh, will I see her again? Will I ever meet anyone again? Like questions that everybody who's been in a loving relationship and maybe lost someone through them leaving them or death or whatever. You know, these are natural human questions. Mm -hmm. But to the point that they had become so repetitive, it was sort of maniacal. It was sort of like an addiction. But for whatever reasons, at this moment that those questions are going around in my head, I suddenly got the answer to all of them. And it was three words. And it was, I don't know. Mm. Like, where is she? I don't know. Is, it, is she with someone else? I don't know. <laughs> Will I see her again? I don't know. Will I ever meet anyone like that again? I don't know. But it was so profound because it wasn't like a, a balm to my suffering. It was the truth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as cliche as it is, the truth sets you free, right? So I, I, at that moment, realized the truth was, I don't know the answer to any of those questions that have been keeping me up at night, literally and figuratively. And for the first time in my life, I realized I've never known. Mm. 
Mm. And I had a completely different relationship to the future, which I realized at that same point is complete uncertainty. We are all clueless. And yet the human design, by virtue of us wanting to survive, it's a primal imperative of any organism is to survive, right? And so if you're going to survive, one of the strategies that we develop is to try and figure out what's going to happen. Whether it's the stock market, totally. what's the wife going to say when you come home late? What's your boss going to say? What are the projections for the third quarter? You know, everybody is, for the most part, consciously or not, fixated on where they're going and what's going to happen. And I would assert, for the most part, it's because it's a survival mechanism. And at that moment, sitting at my desk from Ikea, probably 150 bucks, <laughs> I literally, I, I've never felt such a depth of freedom because I was no longer concerned about anything that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And and the, the sort of the addendum that the most, for me, the most powerful reflection of the entanglement theories of quantum physics is that as I sat there I literally like the cascade that went through my body was like nothing I've ever felt because I didn't even know that I was in a state of tension because that was normal right like if you've been living a certain totally. way you don't know what you don't know exactly because yeah. that had become my you know my my everyday state mm -hmm. but all of a sudden it was like you know, like if you could see this sort of sci-fi, all of the cells of my body like mm. reconfiguring into a position of no longer being concerned about an outcome. It didn't mean that I didn't have intentions and commitments and desires, but there wasn't this underlying current of worry or anxiety about it. So to really wrap it up in this beautiful bow, within 15 minutes of me having that moment, the girl calls. Of course. Right. And I hadn't spoken to her for about five or six weeks. Right. You Which is. Finally let it go and it comes back tenfold. <laughs> Isn't that insane? It's... But it was so profound because the few calls that we'd had prior to me not hearing from her for an extended period of time was after she'd left. And, you know, we'd been close for, as I said, close to two years. So I was the desperate, like, boy, man trying to hear hope or that she's coming back or mm -hmm. something good is going to happen. And, but this time I pick up the phone she's crying and she's like i miss you so much now to me that was the complete role reversal of me being the desperate guy before who was really founded in my own experience of the fear of loss which was well established prior to me meeting her right it had nothing to do with her she was purely the catalyst to help me revisit that which mm -hmm. is you know much of the work that i do with people to help them understand that like life one of my most popular quotes is i say life will present you with people and circumstance to reveal where you're not free, right? So she was one of these people and the circumstance to reveal where I was not free. Why was I not free? Because I was still stuck in the trauma of the loss of my parents until I changed that whole narrative. I didn't lose them, they died. Mm. And that there's still sadness and I can miss them and love them. But if I'd lost something, then that feels like I'm inadequate or missing something. But anyway, so she's, she's crying and I'm a completely different human being. And now I'm the one holding space of actual genuine love, you know, for the fact that she's hurt and she's missing me. So that massive long story is really like, how did I get into this? That was one of the biggest catalysts. And that's when I started my business and my coaching because I, I literally got these codes and these downloads of like how humans completely sabotage their lives. How, why do people get sick? Why do their relationships not work? I just started to see all of the mechanisms that are founded in these fundamental principles of survival. So, Had you been turned on to certain parts of teachings in psychology or philosophy or any sort of thing prior? Or was this kind of like a resounding just moment where it was an aha? It was both. So this was certainly the sort of the pinnacle epiphany moment and there had been certain preparatory insights maybe through reading like I was dating someone prior to that and we were very close too but um, I really got into some of the uh, Indian scriptures like a guy called Krishnamurti who actually was um, he was here in California he would teach and do satsangs in Ojai um, and it was all this sort of non-dualistic stuff that I was starting to look at, like Vedanta is mm. a part of uh, the Hindu scriptures and stuff like that. So I had done a fair amount of reading and I was always fascinated with anything to do with self-improvement. You know, granted, it was predominantly around the body. Like I was a trainer, I became a yoga teacher, I became a Pilates instructor. But 
the yoga was really, I would say, the access point to some deeper philosophies because within that, then I understood and started to learn about Ayurveda. So then I became an Ayurveda practitioner and that had a very big tenant around the power of the mind and obviously our spiritual essence and that we're not this meat suit. And mm-hmm. so, so you got, you were in Ayurveda before this, like you got what? Cause I want to jump around the same time. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah. a lot of like rows were coming together. Yeah. Right. Late twenties. Yeah. Right exactly. there. Exactly. Right then. Yeah. Interesting. And then as a coach, I'm fascinated with it. Cause in this modern day, there's a lot of coaches out there. Yeah. People are, you know, and it's, a, it's amazing. I think there's a lot of people that have a lot of gifts to give and it's like, but you're starting out. It's like, how do you, what did you, start out with you were a trainer yeah, yeah yeah how did you get into like obviously it didn't go from there to where you are now <laughs> right 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 but i'm curious on that journey of the start to kind of building that yeah it, it was very you know much like the whole analogy of how do you eat an elephant like one bite at a time you know it's like and i don't know who's eating elephants but please stop <laughs> <laughs> but, um, PSA. but seriously um so it was very progressive you know it was really like even at college i was the guy that a lot of my friends would come to because i i was a good listener in a way that i didn't even understand i think mm-hmm. i was just very compassionate i'd gone through what i'd gone through with my own family so i think i'd had a lot of you know uh, patience drilled into me and profound acceptance of like hardship in life so when my buddies were coming at college and worrying about a girlfriend or this or the other it was sort of relatively easy for me to hold a space of just like listening um so that was a natural progression that then i started to listen to more people but then there was exchange you know it's like you have an hour conversation and, and and it was sort of like a coaching thing and then i would start to introduce some of the tenants that i was now recognizing as just instrumental in either being a powerful or a powerless human being Mm -hmm. and um and then i the one girl i was dating we went she wanted to go to the sorbonne in paris university she was sort of a francophile wanted to study and so Mm -hmm. i went with her and at the same time it just so happened when i was a trainer we're sort of jumping around a little bit but you can track we had gone to London, me and the couple that I was training, uh, to film a couple of movies. And they were close to a really beautiful golf club. And uh, this, the, the, the husband knew that I was into golf. And he said, hey, I want to come and hit balls with you. He was super enthusiastic about life. Just a, he was a good dude. And I was like, okay, cool. So he said, like, find somewhere to hit. Like, so I was like, okay. So I knew, knew the place. I wasn't a member. It's like beautiful. Yeah. But as soon as I met the owners and told them who I was working for, of course, they're like, well, yeah, we want them to come here, you know, the sort of VIP celeb appeal. And so um, we would go while we were making movies, we'd at the end of the day go and play nine holes and we became friends. And I certainly became friends with the sons of the owner. Anyway, cut to years later, now I'm in Paris. This golf place has built this brand new spa with tennis courts and they're really promoting this whole new way of lifestyle at this club. And they said, would you be part of the suite of assets that we're offering? You know, you could come and do some coaching with people and they can have a counseling session or whatever. I was like, sure. Interesting. So they actually helped. So I would go over most weekends from Paris on the Euro Tunnel uh, under the ocean. Well, it's not the ocean, but the channel and come up in London and go to the club for two or three days and work with people. So they generated quite a lot of press because it was the way that they were also promoting their new facility. So that that definitely got me a little bit more attention. And then I did a couple of retreats. I went to Thailand. I went to the Maldives for like three or four weeks and people would come and work with me. That generated press. So it was very progressive. I mean, this is 20 years ago. So. But you were clearly being effective with people early on. Yeah, yeah. Like that it sounds like to get to do a Maldives retreat, do a Thailand retreat, like yeah. getting people to join you or having this club bring you over. Yeah. It's like you were having... Yeah, I wasn't full of BS. (laughs) Yeah, it's like that. Yeah. That's pretty incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I I guess if I look back even to when I was a trainer, it's sort of somewhat been my, you know, my blueprint, my DNA has just been fully dedicated to whatever I'm dedicated to, right? Which may sound like, you know, that doesn't even make sense because if you're dedicated to something, you're dedicated to it. But people will say they're dedicated and they're not, right? So whereas when I was a trainer... I was broke, right? So yeah, I had an undergrad in human biology and exercise physiology. So I had this wealth of knowledge, but I didn't have an outlet 
to you know have any sort of reciprocation or income but this guy who happened to live in this rent control apartment I was living in the same place where I was sitting at my Ikea desk. You this know? is a powerful <laughs> facility. That right, right. Just... And I was like, where do I go? It's actually 9-11 was the name of the building. Too. Really? So, yeah, apparently it was like for, for any kind where of emergency. Where in Santa Monica? Uh, it was on 9th and Idaho. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, he very kindly said, listen, you're like one of the best athletes I know. You're the best shaped guy I know. Like, why don't you become a trainer? Like, cause I, he knew I was working like a summer job at a bar or something, you know, which was fun. But again, I'm like, whatever, I was 25 at the yeah. time, 26. So, um, he, um, he got, he, you know, said, look, you've got to get certified, get this job and then you can come, you know, and, uh, work at the club. So to sort of mirror your, your compliment, even there, I became the most popular trainer within like two or three or four weeks, you know, whether it was my energy or similar to what you experienced when you came to my place in Santa Barbara, it was just like there was a, a joie de vivre, as I said earlier. There was like this commitment there, and then there were results. So soon it became exponential where, okay, it takes a minute for the body to adapt, right? Mm-hmm. Like I can work with someone and maybe in 20 minutes change their life. I mean, I might need a little more time, but with their body, obviously I needed, give me a couple of, yeah, you know, a couple of four weeks, right? Yep. But as soon as people started to see, and I would work out with some people, so that was appealing because then there was a little bit of sort of like this camaraderie, competition. Um, so even there, the same thing transpired, which is that's how I got my job with the VIPs that I traveled around the world with for five years because the, the general manager of the, the gym came up to me one day and said, we've got two new clients for you, which at that point was like, well, yeah, duh, like I'm always getting a new client. She said, no, these are very special clients. Mm. But I was by far the most junior trainer. I'd only been there for five months. And there was like another 25 trainers or something, some of whom had been there for a couple of decades. So the fact that she was offering that to me, I think spoke volumes about the fact that I just showed up. You know, I gave my all. And I've really, for me, I've pried, I've, I've had a lot of pride around the fact that I don't do things half-assed, mm-hmm. you know, like... If I'm going to do it, I do it. If I don't, then I'm not going to do it, right? So I think the same happened with my coaching career is that I just went all in and studied. I still study. I still read. I, you know, if I'm inspired by someone, whether it be Instagram, a workshop, a, what a keynote like that I can find that's going to bring extra faculties to my skill set, I'm in. Like I'm not going to sit on my, you know, as much as I might be at the top of the the, the coaching, you know, the podium of like the attention that I get and the mm-hmm. people that I get to work for, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm not going to sit there on my laurels. I want to continue for my own sake, as well as my clients to involve, to improve my, my, my skills. So yeah, the, there's definitely an overlap between how it started in the fitness transformation and the mental transformation. So it, when you declare, cause it sounds like you declared internally to be a trainer to mm-hmm. be a coach, like there was a declaration. It mm-hmm. was like a commitment, like you say. Mm-hmm. Is there a process to that? I mean, I think there's so much benefit to, that's huge to me, like right. like your word. Like once you, if your yeah. word means something and you put it out there and you declare, yeah. now that's your, you're going to live to that. You want to live into that. Yeah. Do you have a process when you declare or commit or is it just an embodiment that you, for you, that's worked for you? It's a good question. I think, you know, I think what, anyone listening the first thing before you get to because i would say it's more an intuitive sense like i'm very sensitive in that regard like not sensitive like i'm easily upset but sensitive i'm very aware Mm -hmm. so even as the general manager at the gym came up to me and said we've got two new clients and then i found out who they were who were they tom cruise and nicole kim (laughs) (laughs) yeah 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 it was pretty fun um so even then I knew I was going to get the job. Now, people could argue, and legitimately so, how did you know? And so I make the distinction between knowing K in the mind and no cis with a G, mm. like a deeper knowing, an intuition. And so there was just, so I think to answer your question, with both the training, there was a deeper knowing that, yeah, like I can crush this. You know, I've got the, the book smarts of having studied human biology and exercise physiology, excuse me, as an athlete, great soccer player, tennis, did all the things, ski instructor, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, just that's a, a, a mishmash of different assets and skills that I can bring together and make this hybrid of someone who can tr- 
totally inspire the shift in someone's physicality. And then with the body, no, sorry, with the mind, then with the coaching, I'd gone through this like traumatic, both painful, but then also powerful epiphany with the backdrop of what I would assert was one of the most painful things for a human being to experience, which is complete isolation, mm. right? Only child and both parents die. And to me, in ways I didn't understand, I can remember standing in my bedroom one day by myself soon after my dad had died and realized I'm completely by myself. And I don't think there's a worst experience for a human being. Now, humans have it even though they're married. They might even have kids. Kids might have friends, but they feel isolated. They mm -hmm. feel alone. Like they, I, I'm pulling stats out of the air, but there, I remember reading something about like the experience of loneliness that people have. Like 60% of people who said they experience loneliness are in a relationship. Right. Interesting. So, so for me, that was that that was the springboard against which it made sense for me to know that I could make a difference because I'd gone through my own adversity, come through the other side into this new dimension of complete freedom, not being worried about outcomes, with the backdrop of an immense amount of love and compassion for every human being on the planet because what I realized is the experience of isolation, yes, for me, it was literal. Yeah, I mean, I had some family friends and friends, but mm -hmm. I family had gone, but... The ego, by design, is a separate entity. Mm -hmm. So that's why someone could be married or they could be in a job that they've been at for a decade, but they still don't, see, they don't feel seen or heard because the energy of the ego is an isolated unit. And so even though I had the visceral experience of it, it gave me the capacity to have compassion to understand when somebody's having it, even though it's psychologically and emotionally. So how did you build on that? I mean, you're a human with an ego. Yeah. Like over time, you have this. Profound... That's where you're wrong. See, I got rid of it. <laughs> I'm a reptile with no ego. <laughs> there it is. You're here first. Um, what are your practices to like combat's not the right word. You yeah. don't want to form it that way, but to work with and, you know, w with the ego, like mm -hmm. being this individual that has, you know, created so much for yourself and been in a mode of creation and compassion and love. Yeah equally with an ego of isolation. Like, yeah. Do you have practices that help you navigate the ego? Um, cold plunge. <laughs> Wait, is that the time I was supposed to say? <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it right there. <laughs> I forgot. Uh, no, that certainly does help. Um, I mean, I think I'm blessed because I get, by virtue of my current career or my passion, my purpose, to continually have conversations like this. Mm -hmm. It's a podcast. It's an interview. It's a keynote. I'm working with a client. I'm doing my mastermind right now, which is just so filled with inspiration. So it's almost like I'm continually practicing my own distinctions. So that's the practice Got is it. that I'm continually invested in either my own self-improvement for myself, whether it be reading or writing my book, or, or for the most part, the majority of my time is spent being a source of inspiration for somebody or some bodies, right? So I'm completely Im imbibing my own philosophy. And that to some people might sound a bit conceited. It's, I mean, it's not my philosophy, but the philosophy of freedom, right? Because I'm sharing it. So mm -hmm. even if I'm working like recently, it's relatively recent, like three, four years ago, I started working with show jumpers, right? Horses mm. jumping over sticks. And, um, I, I've never ridden, well, I've, you know, maybe been on a little trot on a beach somewhere in Hawaii, but like I'm not a horse, like I'm not a horse person. I didn't grow up with horses. So even as I got introduced to new sports, new athletes, new arenas, new businesses, new industries, what happens is I bring my distinctions and my understandings and insights, but then I will create off the new understanding of this new discipline new metaphors, new analogies. So mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like I'm constantly refining my own messaging by virtue of the, the, the opportunity that I have to make a difference in people's lives. You get it. It's almost like, I think of like jujitsu or jujitsu masters. They like, mm -hmm. as they teach it more, there's new angles and subtleties of the, of the sport of the practice that come out. And it's like, you're yeah. constantly sharpening your sword <laughs> yeah. and constantly in action with and seeing it firsthand with yourself and with others. And the reflection of others, right? Like, so I would consider myself a pioneer, a thought leader, 
I'm at the bow of the boat of like the philosophy that I've created, mm. right? Like this is very deep. This is what my books are about. I'm delineating the 10 primal prisons of the subconscious. Like there's nothing like this out there, which I assert is why I'm blessed to get the kind of clientele I get and, you know, the, the following that I get right now. So, but then sometimes I'll be talking to a client and they might reflect something that is equally inspirational for me, right? So to your point about jujitsu master, they may have a young buck who comes through the ranks and maybe he's had his own version of adversity and he puts a spin on a move or something that even the master can be mm -hmm. enlightened by, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm always open to equally getting that form of contribution from a client or from somebody that may well actually have a slightly different take on something I've been discussing for a while that gives me like, oh yeah, that's actually, that's a really cool way to look at it. So yeah. there's that, there's that constant reflection too, which is beautiful. It's almost like for my life, I always call them like guardrails. Like mm -hmm. I have, I put, I have people in my life. I have practices, cold plunging, meditation, yeah. working out, you know, things, challenges, psychedelics I work with. They're like my guardrails to keep right. me in check. And it's like, you're always with people in depth. Yeah. You're always in the space of search, you know, authenticity and like conversation the, and conversation. About, it's like yeah. that, yeah. that naturally is going to keep you yeah. like, yeah, it's just like, it's my natural focus. You know, it's like, where, where can I reveal versus find It's very subtle, but where can I reveal more power, more freedom, more love, more joy, more efficiency? These are the things that without even thinking about I'm always looking for right that's that's sort of my my crack cocaine you know it's like okay where can I both for myself and others help inspire a greater sense of joy and freedom and vitality so for someone that doesn't have the momentum you have or the mm -hmm. guardrails or this you know network community yeah is that the start is like find the thing that maybe it's just 1% of your life. The thing that does give you power, love and joy mm -hmm. and just put your attention, like just double down there. That's for sure would be one part. The irony is much of my work is helping people see what's in the way. Like, you know, often, I mean, I'm, I'm much older now, but I'm still in decent shape. But you know, throughout the years I've, I've been complimented a lot and like, dude, you're like in good shape. And like, you know, what do you do? Like mm -hmm. people want to know what to do. And part of my quite quote childlike, you know, nature would be the flippant response of like, dude, it's not what I do. It's what I don't do that you do do. <laughs> right. Right. So whether that be like the late nights or eating heavy meals for dinner or junk food or alcohol. So it's really the irony is it's about what can you see to answer your question for the listener of what they can do and how can they start? What's in the way versus trying to adorn another task like I'm trying to add something right so for me it's usually the absence of something that introduces the power the love the freedom so think about freedom freedom is there as far as i'm concerned like it's our nature it's our birthright it's inherent but we lose freedom because we develop constraints like oh i'm this i'm a failure i'm not that i'm not good enough they don't like me so we progressively over time become less free less joyous and this is the stagnation we see even look at people's physiology right people become much more stiff both in mindset like stubborn and rigid mm -hmm. but then also their physiology 100 percent. and so that to me is an accumulation of stuff that's in the way of the very qualities of life that you inherently have but have lost they're not lost they're hidden so it my process one of my catchphrases i don't solve people's problems i dissolve them mm. And again, that's both empowering for the listener, but it's also for me because otherwise it's sort of incumbent upon me to fix your life, like the audacity of that. And a lot of trainers and you know experts out there think that that's their role, which then they end up on the medication that they're giving people because they're also stressed. And I'm like, no, no, there's nothing wrong with you. Like, and I'll show you what's in the way of you not realizing that. And that's why I can do it. But if there's really something wrong with you and you think it's up to me to fix you, we're going nowhere fast. Yeah. It's like that. It's all, I was hearing it recently. It's like, I'm, I held no responsibility for anyone. Right. You know, and there's, yeah, that took me back. Cause I, I pride myself on having responsibility for people and companies and partnerships yeah. and all this stuff. And it's like that, that isn't yeah. real. No, that is another that is another egoic piece that steps up and you're sitting here saying 
like that probably gives you so much freedom in all the clients you work with. Yeah. Cause sometimes it can be so heavy working with people in theory Yeah. with all these big, big challenges. Yeah. But you don't, you're just dissolving it. Yeah. You don't even see it as a, that's the real Not problem per se. No, I can remember, I can remember doing a TV pilot in London for the BBC. They were interested in doing a show with me many years ago when I was over in Paris with yeah. that girlfriend and helping promote the club. And, um, they brought two people I'd never met, uh, a gentleman and a, and a woman, and they both had whatever their issues were. He was uh, umming and ahhing about a business plan that he wanted to get going, but he's been trying to get it going for like three years. Meanwhile, you know, it's a stereotypical situation. He's got this passion out there, but with all the insecurity because it's his own business versus the paycheck, but with a job that he hated. Right. Right. So that's what he came to see him. And the woman was something else. But with the guy, he was also very sensitive. And so we started to talk about like some of the things that were in the way. That was what I was, you know, speaking to earlier. And he talked about this event when he was on a boat with a kid, you know, as a kid with his dad, and he went to grab something, and the dad screamed at him because it was the wrong thing in the mm. boat. And from that moment forth, he was sort of emotionally paralyzed of like, don't do the wrong thing, don't make a mistake, mm -hmm. you know. Which for a little boy, you can understand. He didn't want to upset his dad, but now as a man, he was still somewhat living in the context of don't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, so you've got a business plan with all of this uncertainty, da, da, da. So anyway, we, we go through it. He processes, he starts crying quite a lot, which is, you know, a healthy release. But then the director came up to me after we're done. And she said, like, what goes through your mind? Like, you're with this man and he's crying. Like, do you ever get worried that like you're like where it's going to go or like, is he okay? Or, and I'm like, no, cause I know how the story ends, <laughs> which is he's going to find out there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> you know? So that is very empowering, right? Because otherwise somebody could be derailed by seeing all of this emotion. I mean, I've even had a client who got very upset at me, which is, is only once, but you know, and I, even that didn't deter me. It was her protection mechanism, just like a dog that's been beaten. Mm -hmm. Like you go near it, it growls and maybe tries to bite you. And people are like, oh, it's a bad dog. It's like, no, it's just scared and it's been hurt. Mm -hmm. So I understand the mechanisms that drive these behaviors where people become mercurial emotionally or they become hostile emotionally. And it's like, it's okay. It's just this inner trauma that is asking to be expressed. So it is, it is I would say, one of the greatest um, attributes of my work for myself certainly is that I don't feel it's incumbent upon me to be responsible like you're saying for anybody else's journey I'm just here as a as a guide as a facilitator to see that fundamentally you are free you are love you are power but you've accumulated dialogues and narratives because of your childhood experiences that are sitting on top of that and if we can just sort of slough off and move some of that to go back to your question earlier of like how can someone start it might seem like a weird response but tidy your closet Mm. you know get rid of all the shit in your pantry empty your garage because they are reflections in the material world of accumulation you know when you move into a new home or a new apartment everybody can feel that sense of usually excitement possibility mm -hmm. why because you saw a space you moved to a new city or you're upgrading from a two-bedroom apartment to maybe a two-bedroom home with a little yard or whatever it is in your journey but you move and you see possibility. Why? Because mm -hmm. there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. It's just the space. But then what happens is you move in and you bring all your shit from your previous place. Mm -hmm. And maybe you had like a tiny closet, you know, in a bedroom. And now you've got a walk-in closet. But guess what happens over 6, 8, 12 months? That closet equally becomes filled. And the sense of joy of space and possibility that you felt when you first saw the property has been lost with the accumulation of clutter again. Mm -hmm. And the same is true emotionally and physiologically. So I'm really, my work is about helping people to just discard, remove what's in the way of that underlying inherent sense of possibility. And you said like, when you were like, clean your room, I always, you know, I get people for business that come forward and be like, I have a business plan. I, and, you know, mm. you get caught in that business plan phase. I don't know what to do. And it's always, it's exactly what you're saying there. It's like, you know what to do. Mm -hmm. The next, There's one thing that you can do. Right. There, we all know it. And we get up here. Yeah. But there's lit clean your room. Yeah. See what that momentum does. Yeah. Clean, yeah. Your, clean your room. Yeah. Something will open up. There will be a new window that opens up out of that. Yeah the next thing will present itself. Yeah. And then you just build and build and build mm -hmm. on that. And it's like, you know, I've always taken it from a business perspective, but it's like, it's very much in life too, mm -hmm. like into relationships and 
all of it and yeah really carry that the going back to what i was saying about you know you saw to ask how i got into all of this and like i mentioned ayurveda briefly where and that was part of my yoga studies when i became a yoga teacher like yeah, yeah. How, not to cut you off, but I wanted to hear how you got into Ayurveda. Like, how was that presented? Because at that time, that probably wasn't pretty, like, you hear about Ayurvedic talk, you know, it's much more predominant now. Yeah. How yeah. did you get into it back then? Through through the yoga. T- so when I was traveling the world with Tom and Nicole, they, you know, he particularly loved all the sports and I was a tennis coach. So he loved that. And I just loved to have all of these extra strings to my bow, you know, so... I said, hey, I'm interested in doing Pilates. He's like, yeah, yeah, let's go, like, get, get it, you know, and then yoga, yeah, yeah, go, like, you know, so they were very supportive of me, you know, becoming increasingly capable in my ability to obviously help them fundamentally. But mm. so when I did my yoga training, um, the teacher brought in an Ayurvedic practitioner as part of, you know, the two weeks, 200 hours, whatever it is we were doing, it was an intensive. But one afternoon she came in and spoke for like an hour and a half, two hours. And I remember sitting there with my sort of jaw like on the ground, it felt like I was like, holy shit, like finally somebody knows what the hell they're talking about. Because mm. at that time, you know, I was looking at the balanced diet. I don't think the New South Beach, whatever it was, <laughs> South Beach diet, like there were all these different things out there, right? Like and everyone's like, oh no, you've got to try the blood type diet. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. eat right for your blood type. And, I, and I'm sure there are certain tenants of each that are appropriate and accurate, but Ayurveda, it just, it just seemed to just make complete sense. Can you kind of break it down? What Ayurveda sure. Is? So it's over 5,000 years old, which speaks to like why it does make sense. The fact that it's still prevalent and it's still like accurate is because it's based on the principles of physics. It's, it's fundamentally breaks down to five elements, space, air, fire, water, and earth. So it's very akin to Chinese medicine. Like when people go to see an acupuncturist or they are looking at the elements and how they associate with different organs of the body. And maybe you have too much air or too much wood or metal they have slightly different elements but ayurveda five elements and they combine to make three what we call doshas Mm d-o-s-h-a and they're called vata pitta and kapha vata is more like the space and air combined pitta is more fire and uh, kapha is more earth and water so we have all five elements and therefore we have all three predominant energies but we are going to be dominant in one usually two we can have a what's called a dual constitution so you and i for example are predominantly fire so what does that mean you know we're sort of more athletic build whereas a vata air person is going to be a lot leaner a lot skinnier mm-hmm. so you think about them in terms of the elements air it's like the wind so it's light it's very mobile it moves it's drying and it's cold so people who have a light frame they're restless they always feel the cold and they tend to have dry skin and internally dry. So they might tend towards something like constipation. They're going to be more air types. Fire types are going to be more the middle size. So more like we'd call mesomorph, you know, like ectomorph would be the vata. Endomorph would be more the kapha. Like if I don't know if you know those body types, but they do. Yeah. So mesomorph is more in the middle, athletic, but fire types. So they tend to be a little bit more intense. They're visionaries. They can be leaders, the CEOs, the teachers, because fire brings light to something. So they're more also the perfectionists because they see everything. They're very visually dominant. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Vata people tend to be much more sensitive to sound because it's like the wind and vibration travels on the sound of the, uh, of the movement of the air. Mm -hmm. Um, And the, the Vata people who have degenerative disorders, like the wind is going to break things down and they have, as I said, like this cold and this dry nature, they're going to have cracking bones, osteoporosis, like Alzheimer's, things where they're losing. Fire tends to be the inflammatory responses. So they're going to have the skin irritations, the liver, the eye. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to have um, acid reflux, anything where there's too much heat, acne, skin, skin stuff. Uh, and they can also, in their temperament, right, they can be more aggressive, hostile, angry, frustrated when they're in balance. And then the earth types are the heavier types. So like a poster child would be like a Oprah. You know, big joints, enduring, good thick hair, big eyes, mm-hmm. doughy skin. They're just solid, but they tend to have the accumulative disorders. The vata is degenerative. The earth and water is the heaviest. So they have the biggest frames, but they also have a heaviness about them. They stay in relationships too long. They stay in jobs too long because 
they don't move very well. The Vata person, they're in a relationship, they're out of a relationship, they're in a job, they're out of a job. They get things really quickly. Like if a Vata person is listening to what I'm saying right now, they'll be going, oh my God, oh my God, like this is, I totally get it. But you ask them what I said tomorrow, they're like, I, I don't remember. <laughs> and the pizza person will, who's Vata's inspired. Vata's fun. Like, Vata's it's are definitely fun. fun. They're, yeah. they're, they're gregarious. Like, yeah, they're like, they're the PR people. They're the marketing. They're the event coordinators. Like mm -hmm. they're, they're the dancers. They're creative right but then the pizza person listening they'll be like oh i've got to look this up they'll be on google right now and they'll be making notes and they'll have a spreadsheet and they'll get it all perfect the cup of person who'll be enjoying their food because they love taste and smell <laughs> they'll be like wait like they'll be quiet and they'll understand it but they'll need to listen to this two or three times to really understand it because they're thick skinned both emotionally but then also in the way that they can retain things mm -hmm. but once they get it they never forget. Mm -hmm. So, but they have the accumulative disorder. So they'll have high cholesterol, they'll have obesity, they'll have depression, whereas Vata people have anxiety. So that's how I got into it. It was just like, like you know, in the five minutes I just shared it, I'm sure people are like, damn, that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very simple context. I'm not an <clears throat> expert in it. I'm actually extremely novice, but have friends that are very into it. Mm -hmm. And so I hear it and it's always just a context to like view. I love how the elements are, how it's, def you know, what, how we break it down. Yeah. Cause that's what we are. And, and it's just, then you start to see how it also correlates to environment. There's different seasons, both in the year, there's different seasons in your life. Like babies are more cuffer. Right? They have mucus issues, they sleep, they're very doughy skin, soft. As we go through puberty, which is a fire transformation, fire transforms, people get acne, they go through puberty, there's this real transition. Mm. And then we go into sort of teens to uh, early 50s is really the fire stage of someone's life. And then after that, we go into a degenerative as we sort of return to the earth, so to speak. And we start to become more frail and we don't sleep so well and we, our skin is very wrinkled. It's not as full and lustrous. So mm -hmm. you start to see the seasons there, but then you see the seasons in life. So for you and I, if we were to live in Phoenix, Arizona, we would just be so pissed in the summer because we're already fire. And then you've got 120 degree. It's so hot and it's so dry. There's no moisture to cool us down. Mm -hmm. But for you, know, you and I, if we were to live somewhere like where it's cooler, it's more temperate, like that's like, I could never live in Florida, right? You know, it's just muggy and hot and it's horrible. So, but conversely, a Vata person would love Florida. Like they're like, oh, they got the moisture because they're dry and they got the heat because they're cold. Yeah. So we balance through opposites. So, my partner she's in we go to the humidity and she her skin's just like yeah loves she loves it. it in her hair and yeah, yeah what about a kapha where where are like ideal temp regions for them to live so they can actually they they can they can withstand the extremes because they're a lot more like tolerant of everything mm. but sometimes to a fault right they can be tolerant of an abusive partner or an abusive job situation because they're thick skinned so a kapha person actually needs a little bit of heat both from a friend who's like, hey, stop taking so much shit. Like they also need heat in terms of working out. They need a fire under their ass. So mm. when it comes to food too, they can have spicy. But in terms of climate, they can withstand many places. A kapha person would really, again, thrive in say like in Arizona because they got moisture and a little cooler. Like when you touch a kapha person's skin, it's very smooth, but it's also a little cool. A vata person's skin is cold, but it's dry. And then for us, it tends to be like warm and, you know, a little bit sort of not sticky, but like, you know, pits of people tend to have more perspiration. So Kaffa could live in an Arizona because the, the, the heat and the dryness would help balance. So, yeah, it's fascinating. And then you look at the foods like Kaffa people need to have spicy food. They can do intermittent fasting a lot because they've got good reserves. A vata person needs grounding because they're all up in the air and they, they said need stews and soups and mm -hmm. sort of mother's cooking. A pitta person needs more cooling food that's clean as well because pitta is associated with the blood. So if you have, you know, leftover foods or junk food, like it can really affect people, uh, pitta people with their skin and rashes and irritation, stuff like that. And does that impact, I'm assuming, seasonal Times well. of the season is going to yeah. impact that. Yeah, it's like pizza people are going to love spring and, you know, like fall and winter. They're not going to like summer so much. But Vata people hate the winter. They want to be on the beach. They love the summer. And Kaffa people, they're going to struggle a little bit in the fall and winter because it's like more the mucus issues that they would have. Mm. They're going to strive. They're going to thrive again more in the spring and summer. Interesting. Yeah. That's it's, fascinating. So you worked it? all that into your 
because you have your whole health and I mean that is mind mind and body there too yes so that's a big part so to go full circle to what we were talking about and how I'd help people and like we were talking about you know clean your room or clean your closet or clean the garage so accumulation is the first stage of disease so when you really understand that it's so powerful so that's where I bring in some of my studies and understanding as a Ayurveda practitioner to every level of somebody's life where they've got accumulation they've got too much shit in the way Mm. so you know, you said from a business perspective, someone comes to you with a business plan, but you're like, okay, well, just go and tidy up your office or you get rid of something that was otherwise accumulated, excuse me, accumulative. And so in the absence, which is what I was talking about earlier, it's the absence of something, there's less weight, right? Because you just got rid of something. That's why, why does it feel good when you do a cleanse or, you know, when you let go of some old clothing? You like sweat. <laughs> yeah, right. Anything that you can trans, uh, sort of transmit and release something mm-hmm. is invariably an invigorating experience because you're creating more space. So the accumulation is, and I'm not going to get into it today because it gets too complicated, but there's these, these stages of disease. But the first stage is accumulation. So basically... From an Ayurveda perspective, the accumulation is too much of one of the doshas. So if a fire person accumulates too much heat, what does that look like? They're working too late, they're stressed. That's a form of heat. They're eating spicy foods, they're drinking alcohol at the end of the day, or mm-hmm. heating. So they've, they've already got a foundation of heat because they're pizza type. They're putting more heat into the system. Maybe it's summer. Maybe they're on deadlines because of some sort of extra pressure with work or whatever. And now they're starting to get really pissed off with their kids, with their wife or with their husband. And they're getting a little skin irritation. They're going to bed at night, but they're getting acid reflux, right? You start to see the accumulation of that dosha is now creating what would be the next stage, which is aggravation. So you start to, you start to notice when there's accumulation because you start to get somewhat pissed in whatever arena of life there's an accumulation. So it's all connected. I mean, the, the food, yeah. the, the, the emotion that's coming out, they're all cues, they're all, all of it. a look at, all of it. or it could get downstream where we're actually into disease and those yeah, of things. Yeah, once you get down to that point, it's been around for a while. And this is why, you know, I speak out quite a lot about, to me, the most corrupt industry, which is big pharma, right? Like they don't, they don't actually do anything to quote unquote help root cause healing, right? They're, they're just giving symptomatic approach to medication and drugs, which invariably is making things worse in the long run. So if people understood how health works, then you wouldn't be doing something that's a symptomatic management of your imbalance. You'd be getting to why do you have the imbalance, right? And that could be either the accumulation of toxins, which is obviously very prevalent today, whether we recognize that much of it's intended, right? The glyphosates and shit that's put on our food or the chemtrails or whatever's thrown out there or people putting shit in their body that they shouldn't be putting in their body. Or there can be the depletion of, you know, vitamins, minerals, things that we need in order to be able to regenerate our bodies and ourselves. So those are the areas to look at versus staying the same person, watching a TV commercial that says, if you take this magic pill, you can still eat your pepperoni pizza. It's like... it's. It's, I mean, it is so asinine, you know, the fact that people still sort of succumb to that. I get it. There's no judgment, but it is such a, a level of ignorance around what it means to be a vital human being. Now, people are waking up, people like yourself, cold plunge. I do what I can. You know, people are talking about what it means to be healthy. Ayurveda, you know, people do transcendental meditation. There's obviously a lot of stuff out there now in the biohacking world and mm-hmm. people are starting to go, oh, hang on a minute. Like, yeah, if I change my diet, my lifestyle, and particularly I'm biased, but your mindset, so you're not in a state of fight or flight, then I'm not going to be on this progressive journey towards sickness and disease that then feeds into this huge trillion dollar beast where they're happily just prescribe you drugs that actually totally. do nothing. Because so, the gravity's there. Like that is everything. It's just pulling, pulling all that. Yeah. And with the propaganda and the lies and the promotion through government and all the rest of it that we've seen these last two years, it's, it's, I think it's the most heinous industry on the planet. But, you know, it's just where we're at as a species. So hopefully, you know, people are starting to wake up. And so what can we do? Have conversations like this and help people to recognize that health is their inherent birthright. Mm. And that if you don't take responsibility for that, somebody else happily will. And it's usually going to be at your cost. So it comes down to both discipline and dedication, also knowledge and awareness that you are by design within the gamuts of DNA and genetic, you know, predispositions, you're designed to be healthy if you have mm. a good mind 
and you eat good quality foods in season and you stay away from junk and you know and you move your body it, like the tenants are out there people have heard these a million times you go to a spa or just for a massage like they're going to have mind body and soul and they you know it's like it's it's not totally. this isn't this isn't rocket science it we it, so diminish the power of our body yeah and what it's capable of and what it's like naturally yeah. it wants to be in homeostasis till the day you die you have a in exquisite piece of equipment that is always trying to heal always till the day you die it will never give up trying to be in a state of vitality <laughs> for you the question is what are you doing to either contribute to that process or to get in the way of it and diminish it at your own expense that's incredible that's it's well said yeah so when you get that, it really can be moving for a lot of people. Now, I'm also wanting to speak to, with compassion, The as I said, I did mention within the scope of whatever you're congenitally predisposed to. Some people have inherited maybe a weak set of cards, you know, in their DNA. And so they do struggle a little bit more with sickness. Like people, for example, who have type 1 diabetes. Like mm-hmm. they're not going to turn around and say, hey, dude, if, you know, Peter Crone telling me to have a better mindset, what's that going to do? I understand, you know, sometimes we do just have equipment that's going to have certain predispositions to a heart attack to some sort of sickness but even within that i still am a stand for the fact that you can through your environment through your mindset through your diet lifestyle inspire at least a much healthier version of yourself now they're the outliers right but for 98 percent of the world's population there's no excuse other than the absence of knowledge so there's compassion for that or the absence of discipline and then, of course, absence of resources. If people struggle, they don't have the money. I get it. Like they go to fast food just because they're hungry and they want to eat and feed their children. But in the long run, it's going to cost you a lot more versus maybe going to a farmer's market, eating organic food. It might take a little more effort to prepare. Or God forbid, you actually start growing your own food somewhere. You know, mm-hmm. it's, there, there are the distinction between resources and resourcefulness is a very powerful one. You know, people complain they don't have the resources and I'll always appeal to, okay, then be more resourceful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also like, uh, like to your, I think we're in like a nervous system crisis. Like Mm -hmm. it's like so many people are like, they might hear this and it's like, yeah, I hear it. Like whatever. It's like, if you can't calm your nervous system down, like none of this means anything. Yeah. And like, to your point, it's like, it might be hard to get organic food. It might be hard to yeah. do, you know, if you don't have a grocery store in your region or you, you know, these things that are real things to a lot of people, mm-hmm. what are ways that yeah. you can get quiet for a moment? What are ways like we all can might, that might be a very radical thing, but how do you like, what are some steps to actually calm the nervous system? Now it's a big thing with plunge. That's my biggest thing with it is like, yeah, yeah the mood elevation and all these things are great recovery. It's awesome. It's like, mm-hmm. no, I'm learning to breathe in the most stressful environment. Yeah. And I think that is the biggest momentum builder that can happen in someone's life. And so yeah. to your point, like, or I guess to mine, like how do we get people to regulate and learn how to settle their nervous system it's a big one and it goes back to what i said about the the shift i went through from one dimension to the next which really is you know the the fundamental purpose of my work is like helping people go from a place of sheer fight and fight fight and flight and freeze which is fear and survival most people are just in the paradigm of fear and survival and i'm introducing them you know, my, my tagline of my book even is like to introduce them to the world of freedom that's on the other side of the constraints of their subconscious. So how do we get there? Well, first of all, recognize it's possible, right? Before you can do anything, you've got to be able to recognize that the, the possibility itself exists. Because otherwise you're going to fall prey to the narratives and the excuses and justifications of, no, I can't, that's fine for these guys to talk about it, but they don't have three kids, I'm working two jobs, mm-hmm. like whatever their justification. So you've got to recognize it's possible. Then too, you you've got to be responsible for what do you say is in the way of that. Like, so what I just shared there, if somebody's saying, well, no, I can't do that. Okay, well, then you've just created a barricade through your own language. It goes back to how we started the conversation, right? So... It's like Henry Ford said, you know, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. 
So be responsible for the words that are coming out of your mouth. Now, many of those have been inherited. You've heard your parents say money doesn't grow on trees or you'll never amount to anything. And you've adopted those feelings of limitation. But are they really yours or are they something that you subscribe to because that's what someone said at you know, preschool and it upset you, right? Mm-hmm. So that's where the work is, right? So there's something that's possible. And then it really is going back to what I said. It's about the process of dissolution. What's in the way of that possibility? What story do you have? that is currently a disservice to the extraordinary human being you are beneath the surface, surface, that is sustaining the world of mediocrity that you have subscribed to, right? So once you recognize that, then you can at least make these baby steps and go, okay, I'm no longer going to stay in this relationship where I'm not revered or honored or respected. I'm instead giving up the tolerance of abuse and harm, whether it be from a spouse, a boss, a family member or whatever. And that can be difficult. You know, Mm -hmm. like the number of people I've had to help make transitions out of relationships or jobs because they realize that they'd become a pincushion for somebody else's projection of hurt, right? So it comes down to like the self-talk. Yeah. Like the, you know, how we're speak the abuse we put on ourselves. Is is 100% way worse than the abuse you've received from somebody else, even though it might not look like it on the surface. And in fact, it's the precursor to receiving abuse from somebody mm. else, right? Again, one of my quotes, I write in quotes, I say, if you don't love and respect yourself, what makes you think anyone else will? Right? So if you start, that's where you really start to tap into the responsibility, like of like, wow, if I say... Like I declare to friends, family and otherwise and on Instagram or wherever that I want to have an amazing life. What are you doing about it in the way that you view yourself? Right. And so a powerful exercise for people is when I talk about collapsing time. So if somebody is in a situation right now, and let's face it, many people are in very difficult situations, Mm -hmm. a situation that they don't want, they don't like, they feel mistreated, disrespected or in some way not acknowledged or, or, or even of value in the marketplace. Use your own imagination. If I could wave a magic wand and give you whatever you think is what you want, because whatever you think you want right now is only usually an iteration that is a reflection of the current what you don't want, right? Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? So if someone's mm-hmm. overweight, they want to be in shape or they mm-hmm. want to lose weight. But when they lose weight, they'll want something else, which is now an extension of this new version of mm-hmm. themselves, right? So for wherever anyone's at, just envisage and even write it down. What, what do you want? Like, what would your life look like? And more powerfully, if you had that life in terms of what it looks like, how would you feel? And so for the most part, let's, you know, there's certain stereotypes of being human. There's generalities. People are going to say that they want more money or they want a better body or they want a better partner, a better job, a bigger home, right? There's usually very few things that everyone's going to relate to. But how would you, okay, if you had all of that, if you had more, how would you feel? Oh, I'd feel just relief. I'd feel I could breathe. I'd feel safe for a lot of people, right? They feel a sense of security. Okay, great. So now tap into that energy to go back to you saying like, how can we sort of reestablish a a calm nervous system? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you are going towards that future, if that's the future you're going to, then you will start to embody the qualities of that human being. So it's like you envisage your future self You bring the qualities of that future self into your current form and that future self would know how to handle whatever you're going through. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you're this entrepreneurial, vivacious, like inspirational human as you see yourself in the future, you bring that person into your home now with the laundry that you don't want to have to address, the washing up you don't want to go, you know, the sink to deal with, or you, or you don't want to get up at six in the morning to go to the gym because you're like, whatever the, the excuse is, that version of yourself will infuse a different form of energy so that you can find that motivation. Because it's the biggest lie. We think that who we are is because of what we have. No, who we are today is because of where we think we're going. That. You mean you're discussing manifestation? Yes. Like actually, Mm -hmm. it's not some, I just think it and it happens. You're talking actually like embody that feeling. What does that feel like? What is that? Yeah. What is it? What is, what does success feel like? Yeah. What does safety feel like? Mm Mm-hmm. Being in that. Yeah. Calling that in. And I just did a workshop at the beginning of this year about the energy of manifestation and how For the most people, it's so misunderstood, and yet it's one of the most powerful energies to understand properly. Most people think manifestation is it's something outside of them 
So it's not me, but I want to manifest an experience and it's always in the future. Mm. If you just get those things, that's why people don't manifest. Because how can you actually embody something that you think is not you? And secondly, how can you have something that you think is in the future? You've never been in your future. Mm -hmm. Versus as I did the exercise there, you manifest the experience of having that future vision, that's fine. I mean, I have a lot of things I'm creating that quote unquote are in the future, but I'm the embodiment of the person who knows they're creating them. And when am I doing that? Now? Now. <laughs> I mean, it, it comes down to it's something I, I, I literally think we are just a mindset. Like, mm -hmm. that's it. Like, mm -hmm. we are, it's, humans have this unique consciousness and we just are a filter. Yeah. And to your point, it's like all the things that we desire or mm -hmm. want into the, that we are manifesting, it's like, sitting here right now yeah and that is it's a very radical concept I, I get that it also sounds really easy to say and all the time i'm still projecting into the future and mm -hmm. wanting these things but to i mean I, I feel it in this moment talking to you yeah it's like yeah what is it's here right now and the here and right now is us so you know it's one of my more thought-provoking and philosophical quotes but i say the seeker is the sort, S-O-U-G-H-T. The seeker, that which we want, the person looking is actually, we are the very thing we're looking for. <laughs> and that, you know, speaks to the hero's journey or mm -hmm. um, what was that book? Uh, not Was it The Alchemist? I can't remember, Paolo Coelho or whatever his name was. It was The Alchemist. Paolo, yeah. Yeah. Um, he, you know, goes on this long journey only to discover what he was looking for. The treasure was like at the base of the tree that he used to sit at as a kid or whatever. I, I, I can't remember it so long ago I read it. But the point is this whole dimension and the experience of being human with all of the trials and tribulations, the drama and the nonsense and the bullshit, it really is for us to wake up and go, oh, oh, I'm the experience of love, of freedom and joy that I'm looking for. And that is, I mean, to wrap this up and that right there. It's like, that was your journey. It was you lost your parents. You're in this seek of not wanting to lose, but yeah. to find love from that same other, you know, opposite yeah. side of the coin, having this moment of, I am, I don't know. Yeah. And I am free. And I am the love that I thought the girl was. She was simply the inspiration and the catalyst for it, which was beautiful. And for that reason, I'll always be thankful and I'll always love her, but no one's in love with somebody else. That's how it might occur. And by all means, you can extend that. Mm. But that other person is simply the mirror to reveal the essence of love that you are. They're the muse for that process. That's incredible. So we're sitting here now in yeah. your beautiful home. Yeah. Obviously, you've created an incredible life. But what are you challenged with in this season of your life? It's a great question. I would say the thing that I still... You know, as a sensitive guy who really cares, like I, I guess as an empath, feel so much suffering out there. And I think the way it occurs to me is it seems unfair, right? Meaning if I look at what I know, the difference I get to make in lots of people's lives around the world, which is so gratifying and fulfilling, but how many more hundreds of millions of people don't know about either me or somebody who equally can offer them some relief from the suffering that they're in. And sometimes that gets to me, you know, and I certainly, I think the thing that gets to me the most where you and I certainly uh, have a lot of simpatico is just the, what seems like intentional harm that is brought to the world by people in positions of power, right? Mm. Without getting specific, just what's gone on in the last two, two years particularly, but it's been going around for decades, right? You know, the sex trafficking, the abuse of children, the abuse of power, the corruption, the lies, the, the, these mandates, the forcing of people, putting people in positions where they're torn between a family member, their job and their own health freedom. You know, like that, that's something that can keep me awake at night a little bit. And I'm mm. like, you know, what can I do to help get people out of an arena where they feel forced into a situation that doesn't feel good mm -hmm. um so that and that's why i do my work and i i guess one of the ways that i help to find peace for myself is that everybody's got their karma not as a justification but 
I don't understand why, to me, what is a blatant lie that I'm listening to, you know, because someone shared a video clip on social media or it's a clip from the news where, you know, uh, an alleged doctor is telling somebody about something which I know categorically is a lie. Mm -hmm. Like, that's hard to sit with. Like, like I'm a big stand for truth. You know, again, one of my quotes, I say, what interests me is the truth, however uncomfortable it makes you feel. Lying's easy. Everybody does that. Mm. And so I have a bit of a visceral reaction to when I hear people pretending, especially under the auspices of philanthropy. Mm -hmm. You know, and we know some of these big money people out there who are philanthropists and apparently noble. Have, it's a noble. And it's a crock of shit. Like you're actually killing and hurting more people than anybody who's not even trying to help, you know. And so that's. That, I could say, is part of my growth. And I don't know where the growth is. Is it my growth in terms of finding more humility and acceptance that this dimension we're currently in is filled with a certain degree of harm, abuse, and maybe even evil? Mm -hmm. And that's just where we're at as a society and as a species. We're pretty unevolved. Or is it the growth of be more of a stand, you know, mm -hmm. be more driven, be more outspoken, which I already am on my platforms, and I, I know it's compromise my numbers on social media because people don't like to the people in power don't want other people talking about the truth but um yeah so that that's that's definitely you know how can i be of greater service reach more people to help them step out of the the madness of a world that is based on the elite controlling the many through the lies of power and corruption and you know blatant harm like that's that's tough to watch mm -hmm. you know because I could sit here and just love my life. I have an amazing life and, you know, but it, I feel like there's a responsibility. You know, when, you, when you're charged with a certain amount of awareness and ability to make a difference, I think there comes with that a certain degree of responsibility to actually make that difference. hundred percent. I mean, that's my, I can relate so much to what you're saying right yeah. there. It's in my, in that same sphere, I sometimes feel like, why did I get so lucky? Mm -hmm. and I see so much out there in the suffering and people's yeah. lives that is out there. And it's a, it's a, when I'm in my low self, I look at it as luck, you right. know? And like that to me doesn't take like, as opposed to gratitude yeah. for it. But I, I totally hear what you're saying of that two dances of, yeah, man, how do I not take the responsibility for the world yeah. and also make an impact? Yeah. And I think it's a subtle shift between feeling a sense of responsibility for somebody versus being a reflection of inspiration for somebody. Mm. Right. So I tend to live my life more from the latter. Occasionally I'll drift into feeling, you know, years ago, certainly when I started my practice, I'd be much more affected by someone's story. And I'm like, you know, someone telling me that when they're 11, a young girl, she's being beaten by a bamboo cane by a mum mm. for three hours. Like, you know, and I'm, I'm the quote unquote counsel for her. Like it's hard not to be moved in a way that I could either feel anger towards the mother or versus just listening. So now I just hold a space and I'd be an inspiration for what's possible. You know, to go full circle to how you started this very kindly saying like there's a childlike, you know, there's this playfulness, but yet there's this wisdom. And if I can, in my own way, whether it be on my Instagram doing a funny video about making nut milk, you know, and being a bit of a clown, or I can drop these pearls of wisdom that are articulated in a way that someone hears them for the first time that moves their life. Like this kid who had been cutting himself for years and was uh, struggling with substance abuse and tried to commit suicide and ended up in a hospital. But he heard me say one of my quotes that was sort of this way of reconciling history. And he actually tattooed it over all of his scars of mm. his cutting on his forearm. So to me, it's like this is someone I've never met. Obviously, he reached out and it's such a touching story and it gave me chills to hear it. But that wasn't because I felt responsibility for him. It was mm -hmm. rather I was sharing something that in a way that I didn't fully understand or know was inspiring for him to see a new possibility. And I think that really is the best way that we can do this is... You know, I think it was Buckminster Fuller said something about like, it's not about trying to fix the old system, but rather build a new one that makes the old one redundant. Mm -hmm. I totally so, yeah. live my life that way. Yeah. I get that. Well, a couple of last, like I like to ask a few rapid fire questions. Sure. Um, three people you'd love to have dinner with past, present, I guess, maybe not future, maybe future. Yeah. Be interesting. Uh, I think the first two, uh, pretty obvious, be my mum and my dad. Mm. You know, that'd be a tough one. 
Um, cause you know, my mom, I was seven, my dad, I was 17. So I'd like to know them, you know, even at 17, like you think, you know, your parents, but you're just so self preoccupied, <laughs> you know, so I'd love to listen to their story. So, uh, mom and dad would be a big one. And then I don't know the third one, gosh, there's some cool people out there. I mean, Austin Powers. <laughs> Yeah, baby. <laughs> Haven't got he that he, one he yet. would ruin that. Um, I don't know. It'd be cool to sit down with Buddha, I guess. You know, it'd be I an epic would, dinner. Would yeah. he join you and your parents, or would you and your parents have a your own private dinner? I might then? ask Buddha to come late, yeah. which he probably would because he's so cool. He's like, oh, sorry, I was in deep meditation, so I could catch up with mom and dad first. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. All and right. Then he would just uh, levitate into the room. No, that's a great dinner. I'm not eating. I'm just feeding off prana. Um, your top three health practices, like these are things that you do consistently. I think I kind of articulated them, I guess. Like, you know, this might be, as I tend to be, the anomaly in the way that I answer this. So health practices to me would be freedom of mind, right? So it's not something I do so much as the way I look at life. Got it. Um, like love, like just love more. Like, and so that could speak to my heart. Um, and then, you know, that play childlike, you know, so sort of similar to what I was talking about earlier in the way that I've declared who I'd like to be as mm -hmm. a human, mm -hmm. you know, to, to sort of be unaffected by life, not in a way that I'm withdrawn or I'm numb, but that I, there's a grace and ease about me to me is one of the most, is the healthiest mindset you can have. So I'm not a victim of circumstance to be as loving as I can in making the difference and care about people, like really care. Like mm. I, I got that at a very young age. I realized how much I care. At the time I felt like it was a, a burden because I cared too much, you mm. know. But now I realize it's actually my greatest asset is that I genuinely care. That's incredible. And then lastly is, you know, to, to stay young at heart, to, mm -hmm. to not take things too seriously. I think they're the three pillars of real health. And then for sure, I do all of the other things that you know. But. That just they're byproducts of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. What what's something you believe that isn't commonly accepted? Something that I personally believe that yeah. isn't commonly accepted. Yeah, that's. I mean, like I said earlier, there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> I I I know. I'd say beyond a belief, I know there's nothing wrong with. But it's not commonly accepted. Most people think there's really something wrong with them, and there's definitely something wrong with their in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> That's the easy one. That's yeah, the yeah. obvious. Yeah. All no, right. I'd say that that you know that you that your inherent nature is that you are completely free. There's nothing wrong with you your greatest asset is your capacity to love. Mm. Love that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to come on and drop in with you and yeah. share space and learn a little bit more about you. It's a pleasure, my man. Thank yeah. you. Where can, where can people find you? Um, <clears throat> social media is now Peter Crone. I actually, it was Peter Crone official on Instagram, but we, I got rid of some vowels and consonants. <laughs> it's just my name, Peter Crone, and equally website. So it's pretty easy, petercrone.com. Cool. Yeah. Awesome, man. We'll appreciate this. This is incredible. Yeah. Super fun. Thanks for uh, having me on the show.